Uh, let's see. Uh, I think he can look at the comments. Live recording now. Okay, that's good. But I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I. Can you all hear me? Raise your hand if you can hear me. Can you hear each other? Pina, can you can you uh, say hi to Bill? Hello, Bill. <laughs> can you hear me? So, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. His speaker's not working. Who's mine? Mine? I know. I, well, I, I just yeah, Bill. We, we can hear you so oh. well. Right. Okay. Pina <laughs> we can hear you well. Okay. Thank you. Right. But, well, the three of us can talk. <laughs> yeah. Good. Um, and um, so, so, you know, Pina, I, I met you earlier. Um, yep. And um, uh, so, you, and, and you go by Cooney, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, just going Cooney. All right. I'm Bill Hi. Westcott. And, and uh, actually, I um, collaborate occasionally with Bill Bonet at Princeton. I, I, oh. I serve on the Innovation and Entrepreneurship uh, Advisory Committee and uh, am uh, spearheading a couple of initiatives, including in environmental entrepreneurship. Oh. Um, but I, I've, been, I've been doing sustainability uh, for you know, like 35 years now. <laughs> now. I was at the Earth Summit in 1992, uh, initially as part of the Italian delegation and then Romanian delegation. Wow. Uh, I actually negotiated one of the first uh, joint implementation agreements on climate change. Uh, ah, you did. Yeah, so 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 very long tooth in the climate area, um, and I think maybe a backup plan could be <laughs> if <laughs> Bill's not able to fully function here, uh, is that one of us could kind of take uh, you know, kind of more of the moderating role. Um, so if you guys <laughs> want to do that, that's fine. Uh, otherwise, I'm happy to step up. Yeah, please do. Yeah, okay. please do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, so, uh, so Courtney, I, I, tell me a little bit more about your background because I did, uh, I did learn a little about uh, peanuts earlier. Okay, uh, I also like being involved in the climate uh, the negotiation since 1997. It's a COP three, oh, yes. and it's like a 24 years. And but right. actually, the last two or three COPs I just skipped because I left the government. Yes. And I'm currently running the, my own businesses. So I do the conflict resolutions and also some other issues. So like outside of the climate and energy, but I also start to work uh, on the uh, some shared electricity using the blockchain technology as well. Okay. So I work very closely with the Australian um, company yeah. called like uh, Power Leisure. Okay. And then also, uh, I also work very closely with the EDF now, Environment Defense Fund, uh, yes, especially yes. focusing on the uh, methane reduction uh, pledge. Oh, so that's fantastic. In, in relation to the energy climate change. So, yeah, for the last like, 24 years, I'm working on climate and energy. So uh, that's uh, what I've been doing besides okay. the other things. Very, very cool. Um, so it looks like uh, we don't have an audience yet. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> even, even though we're, we're at time um, and we're missing our moderator. Other than that, it's going really well. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, yes. That's pretty nice. Yeah. And, and um, have, have you spoken at Horace? Oh, there's Bill. Hey, Bill. Can you hear us Hello. now? Uh, by can his face, us? he cannot hear us. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Very well. Yes. yes. You cannot. Um, right. <laughs> I can't hear you. Right. So let's oh. let's start. Uh, when you were first on, <laughs> we're going to spend. Uh, we've got some. We've got some. A few folks in the audience. Uh, my own assessment of COP twenty six. I did not attend in person. Is that at best we had a B minus outcome? Uh, <laughs> some some successes. Uh, many more partial successes or failures. Uh, Cooney, why don't we start with you? You had said in your uh, in your response that you, you intended to talk about uh, outcomes and also the Global Methane Reduction Initiative. So if you could spend a couple minutes on that, that would be very appreciated, I think. 
Thank you, Bill. And uh, I'm Kunishimada. I'm the ex-Japanese uh, chief negotiator in the climate change. And I myself also didn't uh, attend the COP6 uh, in person physically uh, because of due to like other like uh, constraints. But the, based on what I've been hearing and uh, learning from the news and also my ex-colleagues uh, in the Japanese government, as well as also those uh, within the European Union and so on, uh, like Bill, uh, I also would like to give maybe B minus a B uh, as kind of a score uh, in terms of level of the success I see uh, for the COP26. And uh, it was quite nice that, like, you know, the uh, touch upon the issues of 1.5 degrees is a long term and super long term, like a target uh, for the atmospheric uh, uh, temperature rise and uh, average temperature rise, as well as also uh, uh, the countries have started talking about the decarbonization even more serious and uh, also from the some business like a point of view as well. Even though uh, major countries like mine, Japan or the United States or some other countries uh, cannot join the kind of, you know, the abolition, the, uh, you know, the coal fire plants completely by like a 2050 or 2030 because we're still like using these, especially like for the Asian term. Um, that's something the European Union has suggested at the meeting, especially the uh, chair uh, presidency of the, uh, the United Kingdom mentioned that like, we have to like uh, cut the old like coal fire plants by 2030 or something. It's not realistic because you know, many countries in Asia Pacific, including Japan, have heavily rely on the uh, coal fire plants. And uh, most of the technologies you use in Japan is a pretty like a low carbon uh, emissions uh, technologies. Uh, even like we are just using the coal fires. So in terms, so in that sense, uh, my impression of the COP26 was negotiation is already done. I mean, negotiation process is already done. So uh, the whatever like, you know, that came out from after the Paris is uh, definitely like an issues for the domestic or national implementation rather than internationally discussed or negotiated the details or nitty gritties. So, uh, you know, the, what, whatever the, the negotiation teams or even the uh, dele delegations came up with um, in, at the COP26 was a little bit like a fur from the reality. So they don't like a touch upon the real businesses or uh, actual like energy mix or situation and so on, if to, if, uh, even like in the myth or after the COVID-19. So the, everybody has a different kinds of the, the economy or economic style at this moment. So we need to like, take into account uh, what the reality would be and what each of the countries uh, has in mind in terms of their or his or her uh, decarbonization uh, strategies up to 20, 2030 or 2050 or even beyond. So now we need to talk about like, you know, the some kind of uh, dreams, which is uh, some kind of, uh, you know, the ideal situation uh, talk to even discuss at the COP26 versus what has to be done uh, in the real term uh, in each countries uh, in order to achieve the their respective goals. Like, for example, my country, like Japan, uh, has already, like, you know, the committed to reduce the 46% reduction uh, compared to 2030 by 2030, about 2013 to 30. And also the uh, net uh, carbon zero by 2050. So that has to be like, you know, the, um, you know, the strategize like uh, even with the, the business sectors, how we can definitely uh, compile or com com I mean, to comply with that kind of international promises. So that's a situation uh, in terms of the COP26. But outside of the COP26, I mean, maybe at the COP26, but in the kind of different venue, um, there are many, like, you know, the outside of UN processes have achieved, including the Global Methana Pledge, because of that pledge um, has attracted more than 100 countries. And uh, these countries uh, share the views that they need to reduce the uh, methane emissions uh, by, 2000, by 2030 by, like, an, uh, on average of a 30% reduction, uh, also, like, uh, compared to 2013 level. So in that, to 21 level, so means actually this year. So like, you know, the 30% reduction sounds really huge, but the methane has, a, I mean, the much larger uh, warming, global warming potential. It's a 21 uh, times more than the CO2. 
So the, if the, uh, the countries can come up with the concrete plans, like, for example, like working on the oil and gas sector and agricultural sector and the West sector, and if the, these countries and even the like, uh, you know, firms can come up with the concrete uh, measures to reduce the methane uh, emissions further, then the 30 percent, uh, in my view, is uh, achievable target. So uh, that also set the kind of momentum for the countries, how they can uh, go forward. Uh, go towards the uh, decarbonization world uh, in eight or nine years' time. So that's uh, like you know the, my impression coming from COP six, uh, COP twenty six negotiation, as well as something outside of the negotiation. Maybe yeah. I think I'll stop here. That's great. And uh, if, if Bill's uh, speaker's not working, we can trade one bill for the other as, as a moderator. Um, so um, Pina, g- give us uh, your your take on, on COP twenty six. Okay, Bill. Um, um, why don't you, Bill? Why don't you take over uh, until I can get uh, hooked in here? Keep this moving, and I hope to be able to join you as soon as I can. That's great. So right. off to a good start. Go ahead, and and please maybe make sense to Pina. You go. You go next, and then Bill. Keep it on track with your remarks. Okay. All right. Okay. We read. Yeah. Each, we read each other's minds. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as I am a uh, not the government people, or the, the I'm uh, today. I think uh, I'm uh, one of the representative of uh, private sector. Uh, the, I cannot assess the COP26 itself, um, but uh, I think uh, this kind of uh, discussion or negotiation, uh, international negotiation, is really important to uh, continue. Um, this time, many people said the COP26 is kind of failure, kind of some success. But the, I think uh, the important stuff is uh, continue uh, to discuss on this kind of matter. Um, so uh, keeping this uh, discussion uh, for us, I mean the private sector, it is uh, the eye opener for the, this kind of issue. Uh, I think not only Japan, but also the worldwide. So uh, this kind of activity uh, uh, make us keep um, on watching or the addressing this kind of issue. For instance, uh, the uh, I'd like to uh, explain or the introduce some of our companies' uh, activities. Can I share my screen? Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm fine with fine with that. Uh, if you click on share screen, see if that works for you. But uh, Bill okay. may need to authorize it, which is uh, a question mark. <laughs> ah. Oh, there you go. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, go go ahead, Pina. Okay. Oh, you can, you so the, the I um, <clears throat> into this is just a, a two. Uh, examples. Uh, the our company Asteria is now uh, in the midterm plan, and the first priority is uh, sustainable among uh, four or key uh, items like STAR. Then uh, I uh, quick, I do quick uh, introduction on the one of the uh, action we did this year is CO2 carbon zero emission uh, AGM annual general meeting. So this is. This has held uh, 100% online, and also even the electricity of the this AGM is a uh, carbon offset, and then uh, virtually uh, zero em- emission of carbon. And second uh, example I like to explain is uh, we did a radical decrease of the commute of all our employees. So this means decrease using gasoline and electricity saving the earth energy. And we uh, actually didn't decrease our productivity. 75% employee felt productivity gain instead, and uh, among uh, keeping 90% plus remote work. And also as our company, we uh, resulted record high profit since listed. So this kind of activity can be done uh, for every all, uh, company to help the carbon uh, zero uh, activity of the companies. So yeah, that's it. That's my quick. Right. 
explanation. Well, uh, the yes, I, for I can, yeah. kind of activity, I think uh, the the co companies are uh, the intention is very important. If uh, there is a no uh, discussion, international discussion like COP twenty six, uh, the the companies are less uh, careful about these issues. So I cannot assess. Uh, COP26, but uh, it is really meaningful because it is on the TV, on the news, and the private sector people are aware of it. That's my yeah. take. Great. And, and, and to follow up on that, um, uh, and, and Pina, I think you highlighted the, the, the important role of the private sector, and then Kuni had, had also uh, mentioned that. Uh, and, and of course, the, um, the kind of the dirty secret behind all these UN processes uh, is that it's basically on built on moral suasion, right? There's no teeth. So even if we had a super successful uh, Glasgow outcome, uh, the ability to enforce that is basically nil. Um, and um, there are so many things to work out in terms of transparency, leading to accountability, leading to some sort of, of enforcement. The good news is the moral suasion is working to a large degree. And that's we see this through the private sector, uh, not just in um, heavy industries and in manufacturing, but I think really advancing strongly in the financial sector. And that was, I think, a huge outcome of of uh, this this COP. Uh, so we have the the, the Glasgow Financial uh, Alliance for Net Zero, GFANS, you know, that falls trippingly off the tongue. And, and Mark Carney at Brookfield Asset Management in Canada uh, was the U.S. Special Envoy leading that. And I think that is a, actually a huge success. So 450 financial institutions with $130 uh, trillion uh, of assets under management, uh, that's really moving the needle. Uh, so that's a kind of, I think we need to say the framework and setting expectations on UN processes, we have to understand the inherent limitations with that. Um, and the good news is the private sector is uh, stepping up as civil society is also stepping up. Um, and within the framework, of course, I think there was a lot, a lot, a lot of progress. So as, as you mentioned, Kuni, that the, the, um, the methane agreement, which is not exactly strictly part of, of the framework, but that's, that's obviously huge. And we have like 100 uh, uh, countries signed on to that. There, of course, there's some key countries missing, right? You know, like Russia, I think a lot of the GCC uh, countries also uh, not signed up because oil and gas, obviously huge. Uh, another huge part is, you know, food and ag, which is really worldwide. Uh, and another um, opportunity set, I think, that uh, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, investors, uh, large companies and governments can really get, get behind how to kind of rethink uh, food uh, and ag. Um, and then we have, you know, some you know, famous advancements uh, around the, you know, the phase down versus, versus the phase out of coal. And everyone, you know, everyone's kind of hiding behind India. Like, oh, India said that. <laughs> and, it's re and the reality is there are a lot of people who find that very convenient that we're not going, as you were saying, Kuni, like, hey, you know, a lot of Asian countries to pull the plug on coal from one day to the next, just not going to happen. It's not going to happen in the United States uh, either. Um, so that's, so we're still in the, in the ramp down process. Uh, and I think that's, that's more, you know, looking at uh, the, the reality. The deforestation part, actually, is something that I think is another highlight where we again had good support across the board, including uh, in a lot of countries uh, at the Earth Summit that I was dealing with when I was actually on the Italian delegation and then the remaining delegation back in 1992. Uh, the Malaysians were like, hands off our forests. And the same thing with Brazil, even though the host like, hey, we may be the lungs of the world, but we want to call our own shots. We have our own sense of manifest destiny. We see how all of the industrialized countries basically pillaged their resources, got wealthy. And now they're turning around and telling us not to do the same thing. That's inherently not fair. And that's it's a, it's a reasonable argument to have. But to see that Malaysia, Indonesia, China, India, and Brazil have all signed up to the deforestation agreements, which, of course, covers food and ag. I think uh, that's a huge outcome uh, from from uh, from COP. Um, obviously, there's some, some you know missed opportunities as we, we were talking about um, uh, both the inherent uh, aspects of it and just kind of the maturation of the process of again, as I said, going from tran uh, um, transparency to accountability to enforcement, and that applies to even the private sector. So private sector companies making their commitments, hooray, that's great. 
but being transparent about that through reporting. And again, another, another advance is that we did come up with, you know, reporting standards that are, you know, evolving and coalescing. So that that's good. Um, but to um, have that, um, you know, really ha- be accountable through the government, the public sector, through uh, civil society, that pressure still needs to be brought to bear. And I think all of this really means that the next COP in Egypt is going to be even more important. So we are kind of kicking the can down the road to the next COP. And we've done that actually structurally saying, hey, there's so many things we have to kind of figure out in the next COP. So let's set that up. So it's very different from when the last COP I was at was was COP21 Paris. So I was all excited about that. And I actually was supposed to be in Glasgow, but I couldn't go for a last minute for a variety of reasons because I really saw that as bookending, you know, Paris to Glasgow, you know, coming up with the initial set of agreements uh, and then, you know, trying to um, uh, bring that to a a firm uh, conclusion, uh, even with, again, another inherent uh, challenge to the whole system with the nationally determined contributions is like, hey, every country can make their own decisions, right? There's no standard for that. There's necessarily no no pressure to, to say what, what standards you should be meeting. So again, part part of, of, of the, the fig leaf we had in, um, in Paris, you know, that, that still continues. So there are these inherent flaws in the system, but I, I think we can still work with that. We still make a, a lot of progress. And the big thing, which... Uh, is one of my major policy for, fo- focuses uh, both in Western Europe uh, and in the Americas is circular economy. So I call circular economy is the free lunch for climate where we can reduce greenhouse gases by 15 to 20 percent, either in a profitable way or cost neutral. Uh, and it was absent. It was really absent from the discussions at Glasgow. So that is something that we need to remedy for the next COP uh, in Egypt. Uh, and I think this is a huge business opportunity, an opportunity to see that the gap that we have now between the, the Glasgow objectives and what we achieved in Glasgow, this is going to create pressure, I think, to look into um, uh, how we can use circular solutions uh, to, to address that. So I'd be, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about that. But Kuni, I see you nodding. Tell, tell me your thoughts about uh, circularity and how that fits into uh, climate. Well, definitely. I also, uh, together with the consulting company, um, you know, I also like I've been working on the circular economy through the World Economic Forum as well. And uh, especially in terms of waste management or to try to reduce the emissions from the uh, burning processes and so on, that's also one of the key uh, I would say the education opportunity for the society because, you know, the, we're pretty good at like at doing the burning and things, but at the same time, uh, also like, you know, the process and the uh, waste, but the, uh, we have also technologies and methods to reduce uh, the carbon emissions from that one. That's also one thing. And also some other issues, uh, we try to also, uh, promote the issues for the, uh, reuse and recycle, uh, also like, you know, the use of the things. And that's also like we are also dealing with the leading. Uh, we means actually the companies and also even the Japanese government and also uh, I would say the local governments as well, uh, leading initiatives for reducing the plastic uh, waste uh, that can be also found in the kind of marine environment and so on. So uh, that's also another thing because they're creating the plastics and also the uh, pet bottles and some other things also uh, you know are consuming a lot of energy. And uh, currently, like, you know, the, without the nuclear options in Japan that we use lots of fire plants, right. means creates also lots of, like, you know, the emissions. Right. So if we can just uh, build in uh, recycle processes or even circular economy uh, concepts uh, for the economic activities, that also directly means uh, we can reduce the carbon emissions and even methane emissions, um, you know, the, from the from our like a lifestyle. So that's I think you know the I think the circular economy is yeah. definitely one of the key elements uh, we should pursue for in the business like a perspective. Right, and the amazing thing is that you know we're so focused on energy, and yet energy is only fifty five percent of all greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to deal with the other 45%. And again, circularity is, is a great way to uh, think about that. Um, and the other thing with regard to Asia in particular is if you look at how most people live in Asia 
and how humanity has lived forever, it's under resource conditions. And so we're using innovation to always keep those materials in play. Uh, so you don't you know, throw away a pot with a hole in it, you, you repair the, 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 the hole and you reuse it and you, and you share resources. Um, and this is where I think Asia in particular has deep insights, both from history and current practice, that the rest of the world, particularly you know, the United States, Western Europe, we need to learn from Asia on how to be uh, efficient with our use of uh, resources and, and goods. And the problem is that the opposite is happening. You know, that the influence of the U.S. model of prosperity is dependent upon consumption is mm -hmm. now coming into Asia. Uh, and so we see as people uh, increase their uh, ability to uh, buy goods, they are buying those goods and they're following the U.S. bad example of the linear economy of they use the good and then they, they throw it away. And the whole world is trying to get to a small unit uh, price. So we need to get to scale. We need to have manufacturing in places like China and Asia uh, to get the costs down so that we can afford to throw them away. <laughs> and I think we need to work the opposite. Say the, the, the function we should be optimizing is let's find the lowest cost of value provided. Uh, so instead of let's create cheap cars, it's let's create cheap transportation services. So moving to models such as transportation as a service. So even if I have an internal combustion car now that sits in my, my garage or is parked 95% of the time unused, and if I transfer that into a, or trade it in for a uh, ele electric vehicle, everyone says, hooray, that's fantastic. But if it's still 95% idle instead of 95% used, uh, that's a huge opportunity uh, wasted because it, it's, it's transportation as a good, not as a, a service. And this is where I think that the real innovations need to happen on the business model side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the, uh, you know, even like apparel as a service. And then again, think of so many places in Asia that are apparel powerhouses uh, where they are key to the manufacturing of clothing and, and footwear. Um, and if we can uh, shift the model into apparel as a service, uh, we can reduce the amount of, of waste that has come out with, with fast fashion uh, and, and so forth. Um, but what do you guys see as some of the barriers to, to those uh, transformations? Any thoughts? Oh, so actually, Pina, on, on the software side, this is where we have, you know, fourth industrial revolution technologies uh, to, you know, track goods, understand where they are, the condition they're in, uh, and how to create markets. So it could be, you know, traditional secondhand markets, uh, or it could actually go back into uh, how do we redesign um, a, a computer, a phone, mm -hmm. a car, mm -hmm. uh, an appliance. So you have, you know, IoT sensors in there, and you say, mm -hmm. okay, this part needs to be replaced. So versus yeah. replacing the whole device, mm -hmm. or even sell. Uh, mm -hmm. like a washing machine as a service rather than as a good. Any, mm -hmm. any thoughts, mm -hmm. Pina or Kuni? Yeah, uh, for the wasting things, uh, for the uh, talking about software, the software is basically, basically uh, the uh, improving the kind of situation. So uh, the software, um, comparing to hardware, uh, we don't need any uh, real items to make or manufacturing. So mm -hmm. instead, we can uh, provide any functionality um, uh, not using the hardware or materials. So basically, uh, software is more, you can say, uh, the more less uh, the wasting uh, using software rather than hardware. And then uh, the nowadays, uh, we provide, as a software industry, we provide the cloud system. The cloud system get rid of real computer hardware uh, in each company or the each uh, locations, that actually reduces the uh, manufacturing and also the transportation kind of stuff. So um, that is uh, decrease a lot of the wasting. Uh, so I think uh, even for the uh, nowadays uh, technology, the computer, uh, computer will be uh, outdated. Uh, some years later, so that makes uh, wasting stuff.
but they're using cloud. Um, yeah. They don't need, the company don't need uh, wasting. And uh, right. even, um, yeah, that, that kind of stuff is uh, technology driven, uh, less wasting world. Yeah, in yeah. fact, Pina, that that is my most favorite example of a circular solution is cloud computing, where mm -hmm. you decouple the computational service that you want from mm -hmm. buying and maintaining the hardware, buying and maintaining mm -hmm. the software. Everybody mm -hmm. went, and also the cost of that uh, decreases substantially. So now mm -hmm. you have greater equity. So you can be somebody in you know the Congo and have access to uh, artificial intelligence tools uh, to run your business or run your your village. Uh, so I think that's really exciting. And that is really my, my favorite example of circularity. And as you pointed out, Pina, we're decreasing energy use, we're, de we're de de uh, decreasing material use, uh, mm -hmm. and we're you're kind of concentrating that into these data centers, which again, mm -hmm. we uh, need to pressure the people running and designing those data centers uh, mm -hmm. to to uh, uh, be as thoughtful as possible. And the nice thing is that companies like Microsoft, they just uh, have announced this past year that they have now five uh, different uh, circularity centers around the world uh, to take the, ser the, the, the server blades and basically reuse them rather than basically, you know, send them off to Asia or, or Africa. Uh, and we you know all the horror stories with the electronic waste there which not only you know, is a missed opportunity on the climate side and material side, uh, but also ha has you know, impacts on, on health and, and, and equity. Kuni, it looks like you wanted to say something. No, no, I mean, but actually like, you know, the, that's also uh, something related to the mobility uh, the part, because as you mentioned, like 95% of the time, like your car, like, you know, the, the sleep in the garage and that's the same situation for me as well. And here in Tokyo, it's among the 47 different states within Japan. It's, uh, we have the, uh, the lowest, uh, the ratio, the ownership of the car now because the young people are not interested in owning the car anymore. But instead, the, now we have the kind of, you know, the electric kick boats and some uh, electricity kind of about the uh, bicycles to be shared. It's a kind of shared transport. So in that sense, actually, we don't like, you know, the ride of somebody's car. I mean, the, according, I mean, I mean, except the, uh, kind of a car share services, which is also subscription uh, services by like each like amount of everybody has to pay a certain amount of money and then they can use a certain uh, the hours of the car uh, if they just in the park near the house or even offices. So that also like you know, help us to reduce the emissions from the uh, automobiles. But at the same time, if we can just change the automobiles to the more EV side or even the hybrids or even like, you know, the, what was it? It's a kind of a, uh, batteries, and then uh, we can just, you know, they also uh, help uh, to reduce the emissions from the mobility as well. And also, Tokyo is a pretty, like, in a big city and with the lots of the uh, our population, but the we tend to use the public transport as well because yes. it's super convenient. So, uh, you know, that towards like a sharing economy, but also like a more eco-friendly uh, the mode of transport. So that's the what we are heading to. Uh, yeah. You know, the car Oh, absolutely, and again, that gets back to the mentality of you know, transportation is a is a service, uh, yeah. not 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 like you're in Los Angeles where you say I am my car, uh, and it's, it's more of this the status thing. And we actually have a a, a comment here uh, from uh, Ananda uh, talking about um, uh, uh, the projects uh, working on in uh, in Japan um, for renewable energy, and I think there's an interesting link there. So. Um, everyone's talked about renewable en energy, and of course, that's really positive uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gases. Um, uh, and and, and Kuni, you're talking about again EVs and looking at storage and so forth. Um, but again, on the circular side, is we're about to put in trillions of dollars into the sector, but we also need to consider the circularity aspects of that uh, for a lot, a lot of reasons. So there's the the um, supply chain issues that we're all facing right now. So if, if you know China or others are restricting access to you know rare earth elements that are key for magnets and all these other things that need to go into uh, renewable energy. Um, if we can kind of close the, the cycle more locally, uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're better off from a supply chain resilience perspective. But also we're gonna realize if we start off in, from the very beginning to say, how are we gonna design the EV and the battery in the EV uh, and, and you know for, for the wind and for the solar, 
every uh, uh, aspect of those needs to have a circular component to it. So when we're not creating future problems, you no, know, this is how humanity works, right? We solve one problem, not thinking in a systems way, and we create other unintended consequences. Whereas now we have the opportunity to say, okay, let's actually really think out how renewable energy is going to uh, unfold and what are the circular aspects of that. For example, in the battery, like if we have it as a modular design, rather than have all the cells like literally glued or fused together, and after a certain number of cells go bad, you have to take the whole battery out and basically chuck it. So why, mm -hmm. why not have it modular so you just replace those cells that are bad? Um, and again, have the battery as a service. So even if you want, if you own the EV, the battery could be a service. And so this is actually what um, you may have, have seen uh, Apple is uh, expected to announce in the next uh, year or so is their own EV would be one autonomous, uh, although it's under still uh, an ownership model, uh, but the, the battery may end up being a, a service element rather than a, a capital good. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so we have a, a question from Ananda of um, uh, you know, looking at, at the, the gaps for renewable energy, uh, how can we bring the cost down to make it more affordable uh, in the developing country context? Anyone want to take that one? I, I can I can throw out an, an answer for Ananda. Um, so so again, th this is kind of uh, you know, the, the good side of what, the, what I talked about before. Of like, the whole world is about getting you know the marginal costs down as, as much as possible. Is that we do have the, that scale mainly in China, you know, for wind, for photovoltaics, and that has crushed the price uh, for renewable energy. So that does open up things for um, emerging markets. Uh, but what I would also throw into the mix is saying if we can sell this as a, a service, so renewable energy as a service rather than as a capital good. And this is something that already is happening. For example, uh, in fact, I was doing a, a modeling project of if instead of selling solar systems to households uh, in mm -hmm. France and, and the United States was this particular model, uh, what if we just... Um, basically rent the rooftops <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and we own uh, the solar um, uh, equipment uh, and we have an agreement uh, with the homeowner that we will upgrade, maintain, you know, base, basically, Pina, like you're talking about cloud computing, but have that same kind of cloud computing mentality for solar. So it reduces the onus on the household to say, one, I have to make this complex decision about stuff I really don't understand. They're like, which solar system should I pick? Mm -hmm. And then I have to upgrade about, you know, worry about upgrades or worry about, you know, getting the money for the initial capital cost. Uh, and, you know, hopefully my utility has, you know, offtake agreements and all this very complicated stuff. Take all of that away, make it really simple. And I think that works very well in, in an emerging markets uh, context where I have actually spent most of, of my career, uh, primarily in Latin America, uh, is... Uh, if you reduce those capital costs of entry, uh, that really opens it up. Uh, so you can have even state-owned utilities who do ha have access oftentimes to, to capital um, to go in and just you know have this as, as a service. Um, and it looks like uh, uh, Ananda is particularly uh, um, focused on, on Indonesia, um, which uh, again has uh, a lot of great resources for renewable, including geothermal, which is always the step tile that seems mm -hmm. in all of these conversations, because everyone's so focused on uh, solar and, and wind, uh, in addition to the obvious solar wind uh, tidal things that you have uh, in the archipelago. Right. And it uh, sounds like Bill is <laughs> still figuring out his, uh, his uh, computer yeah. issues there. Um, any, any other thoughts on um, like uh, Indonesia and uh, how Indonesia can move forward to reduce, um, you know, their uh, greenhouse gases? Like methane, like food, 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 think of food, food and ag Indonesia and methane and how that relates to the agreement that you worked on, Kuni. Does anything pop to mind there? Well, first of all, like, you know, the like uh, what Japan and China first time, like, you know, discuss the issue of the meth methanation today, like, you know, the combination of the created the hydrogen also with the CO2 and we can create the artificial methane to use as a kind of a city gas. 
uh, that doesn't con- contain like, you know, the, uh, some kind of GHG components in that sense, because we only create the H, H4, H2O. So in that sense, actually, like, that's one of the ways we can go, uh, in relation to methane. But of course, Indonesia is an oil producing country and also the natural gas as well. And if we can think about like, you know, the reduce the methane emissions and the whole supply chain of oil and natural gas, that's another way of doing it. So maybe they're replacing or put the, for example, ammonia or hydrogen uh, as a kind of coal fire uh, options for the LNGs and so on. That's also one of the ways. And uh, back to the renewables, I mean, if we can just uh, start up the, uh, uh, the renewable projects in the community base, not the whole nations, like, for example, Indonesia is really a uh, vast country, like a landslide, also like, you know, the scattered at the lots of islands. So it's always a quite difficult to like send energy and share energy among themselves. But if we can come up with the renewable based, island based, for example, each island has kind of a different like a closed system within the community of the renewables. Like, for example, demand control, demand share and demand shift. At the same time, it's kind of a distributed energy issues. Uh, that's also like going to help the help us reduce the uh, emissions from the use of the electricity, even like a uh, keep the uh, electricity, even like a renewable based oriented electricity price, uh, keep we can just in you know, the affordable uh, level. So I think uh, that that's one of the ways we can just pursue uh, because using the some cases they, like uh, my the friend uh, company that like Power Leisure is doing in Thailand. Uh, together with the local university, like a whole community uh, shares the solar, as you mentioned, Bill. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the all like, you know, the, the buildings and the houses and that uh, community has a PV panel on the roof, but that's uh, provided by the one of the electricity companies. So like uh, they just, you know, the um, set the install, like uh, all like, you know, the rooftop, like a uh, PVs and solar panels. And uh, uh, the, they will do the all like a uh, maintenance and also even the insulation by themselves. And that these companies always like to buy the electricity uh, generated by the uh, PV and then they sell it to those who are needed at a certain price. So that's also something that we can just use easily, like a track down the uh, generation of electricity. At the same time, needs of the renewable based electricity among the same community using the blockchain. So um, that's one of the key technologies. Maybe like a Pina san can just talk about like a blockchain technology as well. But that's also we can just uh, easily use uh, in the electricity and energy sector, you know, to reduce the actual cost. Yeah, I, I think you know, that's a great, great setup for you as well in terms of like the, the software that can run all of these mm-hmm. distributed uh, systems. And as Kuni, as you said, mm-hmm. if we can solve problems at an island level, then yes. we can solve them at a village level and have the same kind of uh, autonomy and resilience and yet still network effects. But again, Pina comes back to you of like, again. how can we have software that uh, mm-hmm. looks at supply, demand, flows, uh, security, uh, and mm-hmm. then uh, it's going to be saying, you know, blockchain to, to track, you know, who's producing, who's using, and then making sure that the economics uh, pan out there. Do you have some comment on that, Pina? Okay. Um, as I am the CEO of a blockchain consortium, uh, largest blockchain consortium in Japan, uh, wow. I can talk blockchain over an hour. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, uh, uh, to make the story short, the blockchain is a, a infrastructure <coughs> of a decentralized um, the uh, structure. So uh, that means uh, it is very good for the uh, shared economy infrastructure, uh, as we discussed today. And then uh, this, I think, uh, in general, I, I, I'm not so much uh, familiar with the particular uh, issue of Indonesia, but uh, in general, uh, the, the developing country uh, have an advantage to uh, do the leapfrogging of the technology even for software. So many uh, countries, even including Japan, it is struggling to uh, adopt uh, the blockchain because we already have uh, stable systems uh, uh, in a com- country-wide. But uh, in the developing countries, there's a not yet uh, such kind of uh, stable system. So they can more uh, easier to uh, adopt such kind of uh, new technology, advanced technology, like a blockchain. It's like, uh, you know, leap 
uh, Flog is like uh, Africa's mobile phone. Many of you know. Mm. So yeah. uh, the development company uh, has uh, many issues regarding uh, carbon uh, emission. But uh, to, to, uh, for the future, let's say 10 years later, thinking about 10 years later, the developing country has more choices based on the other countries, other advanced countries' uh, experience and to uh, take the leapfrog uh, to the ad advanced area. Uh, that can be done for the, this COP26 kind of issue, energy issues, uh, carbon issues, I think. Yeah. And uh, of, of course, the Sofia can contribute. Yeah, great. So, so I think we're, we're almost at time. So maybe we each of us can take like 30 seconds to think about what we what we'd like to see next year. So at, at if we have the same conversation next year after COP27, what would you hope uh, would be a result? Um, Kuni, you want to go first? Thanks. Uh, you know, it's a quite difficult question, but I would say like, you know, based on the something we have already agreed in the COP26, if the countries, a lot of countries can come up with the concrete plans, how they can achieve the 2030 goals or even like a decarbonizing goals, uh, that will encourage the other countries, even the firms and businesses uh, to take the further actions towards the decarbonization. So now like, you know, the negotiation outcome is uh, good and also like uh, we agreed on the principle but at the same time for the nitty gritties and the details it needs to be like uh clarified and also even the kind of uh thought. so in that sense actually uh for the year from now on uh when we all see in uh, egypt it's uh, like a beautiful like a resort city and uh at the, I, I hope that as uh, many people as possible like we can see the concrete like uh, strategies and plans uh, to be implemented towards the 2030 and further so if that happens, I think we can still on the uh, positive edge. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we, st we need to start worrying about like the Secretary General of the United Nations. Yes, and, and Pina, what would you like to see a year from now? Okay, um, for the COP, uh, what I uh, like to uh, see is first uh, the the continue of discussion or continue of COP, not only 27, 30, 40, 50. <laughs> so uh, it is important to continue this discussion, focusing on these issues. And second, um, I think uh, the, uh, we need to discuss, or we'd like to discuss uh, fairness um, uh, more. So because the developing country says, always says, uh, it's not fair. Because uh, the uh, advanced companies enjoyed the, you know, unlimited thing uh, in the right. past so sure. uh, there's a time difference of the developing of the you know country so what is a fair um uh situation or what what fear actually means such kind of stuff i, I like yeah. to be discussed more that yeah. will generate more agreement on on the cop result I right believe. Yeah, so, so I, I, I agree with, with both of you. And I think the fairness is actually very much tied uh, to um, adaptation, which, of course, is, is uh, you know, yeah. we've talked about mitigation. How do we reduce? But we also need to talk about adaptation, saying we are going to have to live with, with impacts. You know, think of like Bangladesh or like in island countries. Um, and so we need to help, you know, especially the poorer countries adapt to the changes we're facing now and we'll face uh, in the future, even the most optimistic of scenarios. And of course, no surprise, I hope that we have circularity as a key part of the conversation at uh, COP27. So I will definitely be there in Egypt. <laughs> Lovely. I will, I will love to do so as well. Yes. Well, I hope to see you, you, you both there. And, um, and, we'll, oh, and by the way, I think Bill Bonet is also going to be in Egypt. That's his intention, too. Oh, what? What? Oh, that, that's lovely. Yes. All right. Well, great, right. great, great talking with you. And uh, we'll you probably do the recording and uh, see what kind of impact that has. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Thanks.